All right, so good morning, everyone. My name is Tina, and I'm a volunteer with the Indigenous Physical Activity and Cultural Circle. And today I'll be introducing Justin Sackany. And Justin is a Moshkowak Cree with connections with the Atapskat, Kaskashwan, Fort Albany, and Constant Lake. He's currently enrolled in the Masters of Education program at Nipissing University. His background is working in the field of education and youth development mostly working with Indigenous youth throughout the Northeastern Ontario region. And his biggest passion revolves around sport, as he said, mentioned before, and whether that's playing or sharing by coordinating sporting events for youth. And he's grateful acknowledging his Nipissing University supervisors and co-authors in his Master's of Education, journey Dr. Cindy Pellier, Dr. Colin McLaurin, and Dr. Mark Brunet. And today, this presentation will be on the Papino Tohan, the impact of organized basketball and the stories of Fort Albany's players and their community supporters. And we'll just play a short video here. Thanks so much. Um, I'll share my, I can share my screen now, guys. Is that okay? Sounds good. Sounds good. All right. <clears throat> Going to share my screen here. And play from start. There we go. All right. Watch it, Miss Way. Mushum Ganugamut, Dishnakasan. My name is Justin Sackney, and I come from Fort Albany. Uh, today I'm presenting um, the people of Dohan, the impact of uh, organized basketball and the stories of Fort Albany's players and their community supporters. This is my uh, master's uh, <clears throat> thesis that I'm currently working on, and uh, I'm very thankful to be presenting this. It's uh, it's been quite the journey. To, it's been uh, it's been fun. It's been you know uh, pretty uh, challenging at times, uh, just because uh, for me personally, I've been uh, <clears throat> out of the school gig for about 12 years, right? So I got my degrees back in the 2000, 2010 era. So, and then <clears throat> 2018, I decided to get my master's and uh, literally it's, it's starting from scratch. So uh, my recommendation uh, is to not uh, space it out so much. And uh, yeah, so before I proceed, I would like to acknowledge, um, as Tina's already mentioned, my helpers, and my leaders, uh, Dr. Mark Bruner, Cindy Peltier, and Dr. Uh, Colin McLaren. <clears throat> I especially want to acknowledge and thank the people of Nipissing First Nation, where I currently reside, um, along with their bountiful land. It's, it's beautiful here. Um, it's, in, it's in North Bay, Ontario. Uh, that's where I moved to after uh, spending 12 years in Fort Albany. And lastly, I want to acknowledge Fort Albany and the community members who participated in this project. <clears throat> So what, what I'll do is I'll, I'll share the nitty gritty of my thesis, the first part of this presentation, um, just to uh, show how I've done it or how it's been done so far. And then in the second part, I'm gonna provide context behind this thesis uh, just to illustrate where it's coming from. Um, yes, it's sport related, but at the same time, like um, there's some con very important context that, uh, that should be highlighted in this presentation. And the third, um, I'll, I'll finish off on the framework that guides this thesis, uh, which will initiate, hopefully, a discussion at the end um, that will take us into uh, what I believe is lunchtime in your end. Uh, it will be 3 p.m. on my end, so uh, um, thanks again. <clears throat> okay, so um, I am Ishkigo at Cree, uh, the oldest two boys. Um, my lineage uh, is derives from the James Bay Coast. So um, it's from Constance Lake, Fort Albany, 
Kashachwan and Atawapis get. Uh, I'll show you uh, some uh, diagrams uh, for later on, just to give you a, an idea. My parents' names are Edmund and Helen Sackany. Uh, keeping in with Cree tradition, we introduce our parents um, just to show you that we're, where we're coming from. I was born and raised in the urban setting of Timmins, Ontario. Um, however, Fort, Alb Fort Albany was my second home because uh, my parents would send me up there during my upbringing on my summers and my March breaks, sometimes Christmas holidays, um, until my last childhood visit in 1996. So I was in grade eight at the time. Um, I was 13 years old and I did not return until I was an adult. Uh, 24 years old. So 11 years, I took a break from visiting my home community. Um, uh, during those years, I became involved in sport. So sport took up a lot of my time and, and my visits to Fort Albany um, took a back seat, we'll say. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I moved out west, out east, I mean, to Fredericton, New Brunswick my, for my first degree. And after um, that experience there, I moved back to Fort Albany to uh, secure employment. Uh, out east was hard to obtain a, uh, any full-time significant employment, so I looked elsewhere uh, throughout Turtle Island and uh, a job in Fort Albany uh, called my name, right? So uh, there I spent the next 12 years um, uh, working and developing my skills and going back home, really. So uh, at the time I didn't know, but people would say, welcome back home, Justin, you know, like, um, that's what people would tell me. And uh, of course, back then, you don't really believe it. You're just there for the job, you know, stay there for a year or two. So uh, what I ended up doing during my free time is I spent many hours with youth learning to play basketball. They found out I played basketball and they were looking for someone to play with them and help them learn, right? So, uh, so the only way I knew how to engage in that sport, um, I pushed on the youth, like I said, you have to do it a certain way of uh, practicing, you know, the karate kid style, and you gotta do things, you know, like that, that kind of thing. So I came with a set of knowledge towards the sport and I pleaded with them to do the same. So um, <clears throat> so historically about Fort Albany, um, just showing you some winter road pictures here, just uh, what, what we see when we drive there. Um, there was an egregious attempt uh, made toward my family to, uh, take away that all we all we knew all that we knew so um, our culture and traditions right so I am so thankful that many of um, my people um, chose to keep their traditions and values that were being trampled on at the time and um, I mean, there's a lot of pressure um, and quite frankly they did a good job so to uh, eradicate that and uh, right now we're still uh, through this presentation, you'll see we're still trying to reclaim. And um, in my own way, this thesis is uh, another means to continue the tradition of being a helper. Um, I come from a family of helpers, or Shkabewis, they call it here in uh, Nipissing. And um, I want to show other, way, other communities, like there are communities wanting to um, infiltrate sport for their youth, you know, like I know some communities uh, don't uh, have that yet and they want to. so. My thesis is geared towards those communities. Um, in, I'm not saying not all there's, there's communities out there not playing sport. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying um, if they want to take it to another level is what I'm trying to advocate, right? So, um, and there's a, there's stories out there as well for sports and youth, and uh, that should be shared. So yeah, um, so I'm often thinking of First Nation individuals on Turtle Island who had to go elsewhere to grow up outside their communities. And um, if they're yearning to reconnect their spirit back home, um, I hope this uh, helps them uh, give them a direction or ignite that spark that, uh, that desire. So um, hopefully they learn from my lessons, right? So, um, and it doesn't have to be sport. They don't have to bring back home a sport. It could be a passion, you know, just could be anything that they're passionate about that, uh, that helps the person as a whole. So I just want to um, reach those people. Maybe I could find one person and like, hey, you could go back and share your music skills or something. So 
Um, <clears throat> so I'm presenting to you as a community member first. I know it's a thesis. I know it's a, I'm a graduate student, but um, I keep that in mind. I'm a community member of Fort Albany and I'm presenting you as such. And second, as a basketball coach, because uh, I became a coach when I, when, when I moved back home, um, not by choice, but by necessity. So, and <clears throat> of course, a close third as a striving academic. Um, I hope this uh, presentation ignites a meaningful discussion at the end. And uh, thanks again for being here. So I'm just showing you, <clears throat> these are my kids. We go hiking, uh, the pandemic, you know, can't play basketball as a group of people. So what else is there to do? Well, let's go, let's go walk, you know, go hike, showing these kids. Okay, so again, nitty gritty of the thesis. So I'll uh, quickly go over this and uh, we'll move on to the second part. So the purpose of my thesis is what are the lived experiences of former student athletes from the Cree community of Fort Albany First Nation who participated in the provincially sanctioned NUA Basketball League? Uh, what are the lived experiences of parents, school, and community supporters of the student athletes who participated in the NUA Basketball mm -hmm. journey? Um, so it's just not the players that were that I'm going back to. It's the people who were behind the scenes who helped me fundraise, a chaperone, all that stuff. So um, it's not just former student athletes. <clears throat> so just the. Uh, just to share a little bit of the Northeastern Ontario Athletic Association. A lot of you sport people know every province has uh, their own provincially sanctioned uh, high school league. So it's a volunteer based organization that's mostly run by high school teachers. Um, our region, the NUA, is, goes from far as Attawapiskat, which is north, Kirkland Lake, that hugs the Quebec border, uh, Hearst, the farthest west between Timmins and Thunder Bay, Ontario, and New Liskert is the south. So Timmins, Ontario is central. So it's a very vast uh, association, again, responsible for administering a bunch of sports outside of basketball. And uh, for me personally, I did basketball, I did uh, cross country, I did curling when I was uh, growing up. So I did all these sports, it was fun, and I look back fondly at it. And in the context of Fort Albany, um, they never participated in the U.S at any time prior to me moving back up north. So from 2011, 2014 is when we, uh, Fort Albany uh, participated in NIOA. <clears throat> so again, um, I had uh, trepidation of to do research in Fort Albany, just cause you know, <clears throat> they're, they're, there's a history there <clears throat> as we all know. Uh, past research in indigenous, communi indigenous communities has typically been, typically been problem or defic deficits based. What's wrong with us? You know, that kind of thing. Uh, some research has tended to treat us in a colonial, archaic, generalized manner. Um, this is often referred to as pan Indianism, which means that all First Nations practice the same customs and traditions universally, which is not the case. Okay, so many people are still getting there, okay? So um, uh, being Indigenous does not mean you have a clear path to research in any community, reinforcing the notion that profound and relevant community research comes from within. So um, as for my thesis, uh, the qualitative research approach uh, that it relies on is any new uh, storytelling, Cree, uh, we refer to as Tepachmon. It's a Cree word meaning stories. Uh, storytelling is a form of sharing knowledge. It's an act of um, uh, gift, providing gifts uh, to be shared from one person to another, and it supports wellness. It's a very uh, respectful exchange of um, knowledge, information, and it's based on respect. Uh, Tepachimon is a historical life experiences of the storyteller, the telling of historical accounts of the people who are either known or remembered by the storyteller. Um, there are stories out there that uh, are referred to as legends, but and many of them are still revered as uh, truth that happened to people that we do not, we no longer know, right? So uh, stories are a huge part of our culture, uh, story sharing. So that's what this thesis relies on. Uh, community protocols in another uh, <clears throat> conference, this, this part will be a, a big uh, topic highlight. Um, I just uh, <clears throat> wanna briefly share my steps to uh, 
to getting to this uh, thesis, the first step I did was uh, talk to a respected elder in the community. Um, most people think of it as the chief you go see, but uh, in reality, most communities have designated uh, people that uh, are referred to if you want to go ask questions about community protocols and all that stuff. So um, we, I went to go see an elder. <clears throat> Uh, second step was getting permission from the political, of course, you got to go see chief and council, and that's what I did. I got written permission, and they wrote to ethics in my on my behalf to conduct research. Third was letting the community know through um, social media. I didn't have the privilege to uh, go up there and, you know, have a little presentation for people to invite and to uh, share, and you know, so I didn't have that privilege this, uh, this time around, but I uh, was able to share on social media, and of course, finding the participants. So, and um, the sampling of my thesis is purposive, meaning like there's a set of people, you know, there's a chunk of people that <clears throat> are geared towards in terms of this uh, uh, thesis. So of course, the former players, and of course, the parents of those players, the educators at the time, and uh, even supportive community members, those who help fundraise, those who help chaperone, there are some community members who had no direct link, but maybe a cousin, you know, down the road, down the line there, but no one, like, uh, no child or like, there were actual people who just who were just, who just love their community and they wanted to help, who wanted to be there to uh, help me see this through, right? So we included them as well. So <clears throat> um, this obviously relied on uh, interviews. So I had to transcribe the interviews and, that was quite the process. Uh, one of them actually said, you know what, Justin, you made me run all those times. I, I'm going, I'm going to talk till I'm blue in the face and you're going to have to transcribe this. So she, yes, and she did 15 pages later and uh, I transcribed her uh, interview. It took me a Saturday and a Sunday, which is fine. <clears throat> she had a lot to say. And uh, right now I'm in the thematic analysis part. Uh, I was hoping to get done in April, but I got uh, cut off by COVID and I'm, I'm still uh, uh, recovering. Um, my mood, my energy is coming back. It's good, all right? So, and I'm, this helps, this uh, presentation, this um, event has helped me uh, with my energy level. So, miigwech. Uh, I'll share some notable quotes. I won't read them out. I, get, I think you guys could read while I'm discussing. Um, some things that I've uh, come up with. So uh, uh, this is a big one. This is the biggest one. I just thought I'd start off. Um, we could discuss more about this, these quotes later. Um, there's some interesting things that were said that I didn't think about, of course, you know, being as coach. Um, and I was really happy to hear it, you know, to experience what they, they were telling me. So, um, yeah, so this one's a skill development one. <clears throat> so they're just sharing, you know, what they've attributed from their experiences to their, you know, current lives. And, and you know, like this isn't uh, entirely new. Like I'm sure this, these things have been said in other studies. And, but uh, yeah, as, as I go on, <clears throat> you'll, you'll see the context behind these statements and how notable they are when we um, dive into the uh, dynamics of Fort Albany. So I'm gonna assume that most of you have read those and they get shorter as we go. And just a couple more here, nothing crazy. I didn't wanna to share too much. I just wanted to share you know, a glimpse of uh, things that, uh, that we had to endure to play organized basketball in a, in a community that is considered remote. So for all you sports fans there, like uh, reading these, you'd be like, yeah, yeah, I can, I can relate or I can see how organized sport could benefit a community that is up there in the in destination, right? So. Um, I want to keep. I want to keep in mind too. I know where I'm presenting. I'm presenting in Victoria. I think from Manitoba all the way to BC. A lot of the communities, Indigenous communities, they they have they have sports all set up. 
they, they're probably a generation or two ahead of where we are in, in our region, right? So, um, yeah, so I know I know the audience there will say, well, you know, we have basketball since, you know, the 70s, the 60s, you know, like, we have a culture of sport, like, already, right? So, and uh, I've seen, I've seen the quality of basketball, quality of uh, sports from those areas, and it's impressive. To be honest, so um, so in a way, I'm like, we can do that too, right? So we can, like, I believe in it. So, and I know you guys do as well. <clears throat> being being involved in sports, like, it's it's not um, impossible, right? So, and this quote here, <clears throat> I don't know. I, I think about it driving, or I uh, come back to it a lot, right? So. Um, and this one, uh, this one definitely gets to me. <clears throat> All right, so, uh, <clears throat> so I believe this is where I take my little break because I need one right now. Um, <clears throat> so this is the academic part. Um, <clears throat> what I wanted to do was to symbolically say to you guys, okay, now you're coming for a visit. You're going to come to my area. So I'm going to play a song that illustrates where I'm from and who we are. And, and just symbolic, symbolically or spiritually, tell yourself, okay, I'm walking to Meshkegok territory for the next two minutes. I'm going to meet Justin there. And uh, Justin's going to get his break and get a second wind. And, uh, and do your thing. Get a drink or, you know, go for a walk if, if you don't. You like listening if you need to get up you know it's been a long day of sitting already right so um if you could play that video next that would be great and do i stop share yes that would be great Justin. all right yeah stop share <laughs> Thank you. 
Yeah, miigwech. <clears throat> I really, really needed that. I need that break. So, uh, all right, context of Fort Albany. <clears throat> okay, so Fort Albany is located 300 kilometers north of Timmins, okay, Timmins, Ontario. Um, there's no road access to the community that connects to the rest of the province country. Uh, so that, that's during the spring, uh, blooming earth, summer, fall, and freeze up season. There's no road access. Um, you can access Fort Albany by airplane during those, those times, uh, and then by boat. <clears throat> during uh, spring and summer and fall. Uh, blooming Earth is between, is before Blooming Earth. Okay, spring, Blooming Earth, summer. Okay, so we have six seasons in, in Cree territory. Uh, during winter, winter season, there's a winter road that connect, connects all of the Meshkigawak Cree communities to the rest of the province country. So it's pretty, it's pretty wild <clears throat> to uh, drive it. And just to give you a visual of where we are. So can you guys see my arrow or? Someone, Fort Albany is in the, the middle there. So it's by the James Bay Coast. <clears throat> so these communities, uh, they're all uh, fly-in communities, remote, okay, so. And just to give you close to visual, the red are uh, municipalities in Northern Ontario and the black are all the indigenous communities in uh, Ontario there just to give you a, just to give you an idea of the of the location of uh, of our communities so <clears throat> we had to play teams in like Capus Case and Hearst Cochrane Timmins you know that's where we had to go to play our league games uh, we had to go a great distance just to play basketball oh having type difficulties here all right okay so just to finish off with the framework of the thesis um obviously there's mental and physical benefits that we don't have to uh dive in i'm sure many of you have even experienced those benefits right so uh <clears throat> but the unique um um aspect of this thesis is to develop delve into the relationship between sport in the cultural and spiritual realm um, in a Cree community. Um, there's um, further research needs to be done in terms of what extent does sport play in cultural and spiritual development in ind indigenous communities and vice versa, like um, practicing cultural and spiritual traditions, like how much does it help youth in sport, okay? Um, how much of a medium is sport towards uh, that way of life? Like, you know, there, these are conversations that uh, are just beginning. Um, I'm not trying to say that this is like groundbreaking theory stuff. Like, it's more of a like, okay, it's okay to, you know, tread in this territory just to, um, <clears throat> without having to share our knowledge, like our traditional knowledge. Like I'm a proponent in, you know, keeping keeping those, stories those traditions in the communities like i'm not saying this is bringing academia you know i'm not saying that at all right so i'm just saying like how much does it help the individual <clears throat> and vice versa so <clears throat> and the uh, other nitty-gritty of the uh, framework here um, holistic growth is what i come up come up with it incorporates both positive youth development outcomes and the development of application of life skills. So we're looking at those two things and how much it helped in that matter. Um, in the context of this study, the term holistic growth illustrates the connections that were made from the neo abascal experience to the life experience and stories from all participants in the study. Youth sport investigators employing PYD take a strength-based approach by holding the central tenant that youth from all backgrounds have the potential to be valuable contributors to society, as opposed to problematic individuals that need intervention. <clears throat> it is through this sport participation pathway that sparks the assumption that life skill development is later transferred through the teachings from the sporting experience. Um, it is important to see how these concepts are applied from a Cree perspective that involves the remote community. Also, this is perhaps one of the main reasons why I wanted to investigate this topic. 
I truly wanted to see how much did the basketball experience influence the lives of those who participated and helped me succeed us through. <clears throat> and this is my framework uh, diagram that I've come up with and uh, pretty proud of it. Um, they were harping on me uh, when I say they, my committee. So you got to come up with a diagram, Justin, to help you, to guide you through this thesis. I'm like, I have no idea what you're talking about. And they kept like explaining it, explain, explain it to me like I'm five, you know, like I don't know what you're talking about. <clears throat> so, so this is what I come up with after numerous conversations. <clears throat> and uh, I'll, I'll read it through. And then that will be discussion period. I hope uh, I'm not, not too much over two. There is 229, it's not bad, okay. Okay, so the, the graphic design was created by Mr. Lucas Armstrong. He's a local resident from the Pissing First Nation, a young man. Um, he answered my plea on social media and uh, I'm very thankful for him, for him to step up like this. Um, I'm not a graphics guy at all. So it was nice to get someone to uh, spend uh, quality time on it. Um, the people no doohan, okay? It, it means ball that fits. It's the, it's the literal description of basketball. You know, when you go up north, there's no word for basketball in Cree, obviously. So that's what they describe the sport as, uh, the people no doohan. Ball that fits. So, so then uh, this ball right here fits as well, right? So it has a double meaning. Um, basketball is a central theme of the thesis. So this is a form of a basketball, if you haven't noticed. Um, and I'll describe the and explain the components within this uh, diagram. Uh, the outer layer of the figure is sweetgrass with three braided strands. Each strand represents the outside influences of a child of a youth experience in Fort Albany. Now, one is family, two is school, and three is community. These entities surround the individual, which influences and directs youth upbringing, as it symbolizes the notion that, that a community is influential toward the growth of a young person. Okay, so on the top hemisphere here, the top half of the basketball is uh, Cree ways of knowing and being, and I would assert that many indigenous uh, communities um, outside of Cree would also uh, view things this way, you know, similar. Um, so there are four realms of individual's experience, existence. They are mental, cultural, spiritual, and physical. Each realm can be influenced by what the community decides on how to achieve this development. The bottom hemisphere, are the important elements of organized sport development. One could be, one could interpret that the bottom hemisphere is sport culture, meeting the top hemisphere that is Cree culture. So we're combining both culture, cultures here. Uh, this section is made of four components, which are rules, voluntary competition, and physically challenging. These components must be wholeheartedly accepted by the community and especially sport participants as absolutes especially if one wants to enjoy the benefits of competitive sport or organized sport. <clears throat> the dotted gray circle represents all those participants within sports programming. This circle surrounds the individual represented by the smallest and central circle. In a nutshell, everyone will have the opportunity to tell us what these elements meant to them as student athletes and how the sporting experience reflects on them today. To illustrate the seams of the figure, the term holistic growth is the mesh throughout so uh, showing how the sport experience influenced their lives during and after sport. <clears throat> and the button's not working today. Thank you for attending my presentation, Miigwech. Um, just to, to conclude um, for the, ba for the <clears throat> basis of this thesis, this presentation, I call Fort Albany remote, but um, it's not, for me, it's not, it's not a remote place. It, um, remote uh, insinuates a lot of things and um, Fort Albany is the center of my universe and it's not remote. So I just wanna make sure I make that clear. Um, it, it serves a purpose and, but spiritually deep down, it's, <clears throat> I don't view it that way. So uh, <laughs> miigwech, uh, I hope um, there are some, things that you're thinking about and it's percolating in there. Like, man, I want to ask him about this. I hope there's some of that. And um, I'm totally game. Thank you. Thank you for, uh, for attending. And just wanted to uh, tell you about the first uh, soundbite that we, that I did. I was just paying homage to, uh, 
to uh, Wolfpack, there's a rap band from Fort Albany. I'm trying to promote the uh, talent that's, that's in my area. Um, can't do it physically and show you like basketball videos or anything like that, uh, what we did. So I was like, how can I promote my people, my area? So I just wanted to share some videos. And if there's time, I'll share one more, but uh, I'm not too overly concerned about that. So. Miigwech. <clears throat> Thank you, Justin, for your wonderful presentation. Now I would like to open up the floor for any questions that any of the attendees may have. Please feel free to raise your hand using the Zoom emoji reaction button down there, or you may pop up a question in the chat and we'll read it out to everyone. Thank you. Hey, Justin. Okay. I don't know if you recognize me, Bradley's sister. Uh, hey, yeah, yes, I remember. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just wanted to ask you, um, when you started basketball in Fort Albany, um, how did you, like, I know you started like a, a, a pretty solid program. There's something similar that we're doing here in Wemengi. Um, for people that don't know this area, I'm Justin's neighbor across the bay. I'm the Eastern side of Justin. <laughs> um, we have a bear program like that we run in school for sports and like bear um, they is the most symbolic animal in our side of the territory. It's the most highly respected animal. And so we were like, um, for to push student athletes to stay in school and to be in sports, we came up with this program. And the acronym for BEAR is behavior, effort, attendance and respect. And they had to, I know you had like a similar program going on in Fort Albany. Uh, yeah, sort of, yeah. Um, it was the youth intervention program. And that was geared towards youth who were um, under the, you know, judicial system and probation and all that stuff. So I, we promoted, okay, Let's get a basketball, let's do a sport program going and get these kids off the street. You know, that's what they say, right? So, and that's basically how it uh, happened is like, yeah, it did, programming did help in that. But I would say, I think what, what you're asking is like, how do we take them in the major next step or how do we get them to buy in, right? So it really depends on youth. Like I find youth have the say um, how it started in Fort Albany the first few years is just one tournament a year. And, and we would practice all year just for this one tournament because, you know, it's 5,000 bucks to get a bus to a nearby community on the winter road. That's the only time we could do it on the winter road. And, uh, it just flared from there because they would get their, you know, their shirts taken off. <laughs> they would get beat pretty bad, you know, and then after the, uh, tournament they would say how do we get better like it's embarrassing you know like losing in the like well first like we got to understand the community has to decide do you do this to stay active do you do this to compete you know like that's one thing you got to come to terms with like I don't know how to get that going but I just asked them do you do you want to be competitive or are we doing this for fun like I'm having fun and uh you know, I want to win. Yeah, I want to try to win. I'm like, okay, there's a certain way, you know? So it's really up to the youth. Like if youth want it, then you present them here. This is what you do, right? So <clears throat> I think if we, if people like what you're doing now, it sounds like we're just doing this for fun to help you uh, obtain some education to keep you on track. We're doing all this. But when it comes to that deep spiritual i want to do this and get really good at it and i want to be committed you know like it really depends on youth and i think conversation with youth like what do you want from this sitting them down like what is it that you want right so 
I want to say that, yeah, I wanted to do this. This was my goal from the start. I wanted to start a program and I wanted to win. Like, I want to say that to you, but now I just, it's more like I wanted to stay in shape because, you know, I'm getting older and <laughs> you kids help me, you, help, you kids help me run around, you know, stuff like that. So, um, so I think that's something I wanted to be clear about is that the youth wanted to take those steps, right? So um, I only say that because from experience, I stayed there long enough to know what a group of youth want. So I had the privilege of having a group of girls who wanted to be as best as they can be. And they made the provincial tournament. We won our Miwa regional, which was such a great feeling. Like I didn't even bother mentioning that because it's not one of my things that I want to tell people, but yeah, we did make provincials and uh, it was fun to like have a team not miss practice. Like I can, I remember two girls missing practice, one for a dental appointment and one for a birthday party. So, and they both told me we're missing practice because of that. I'm like, okay, the rest of the season, no one missed the practice. Like then the following years, I had youth who weren't as dedicated. They just wanted to have fun, right? So um, I had a transition to there. Like, okay, I just went from really super competitive to a group that's not so competitive. They just want to have fun whenever they feel like playing and stuff like that. So it's a lot of um, flexibility you need to coach in a First Nations community. So, so in a long-winded answer, it really depends on youth and what they want and just sitting them down and asking them, what is it that you want from this? And so, okay, the next question, how do you get them competitive if they want them? And I think the only way is travel, get them out of the community and play other people. So organize. And I know our region is like, well, it's so far, like it's so expensive. Like we have all this, um, stuff to do just to get to Rouen, Aranda, Val d'Or, Amos, you know, I'm talking Quebec here. A lot of uh, resources, right? And it is, it's, it's hard. Like what I'm trying to say now to communities, like how about just make your own league? Because out west, uh, there's BC there. They have a two week tournament where all the communities get together. And I've always wanted to go teach there and coach one of those teams just for that, you know, just, just to try because I have a teaching degree. So. But yeah, just um, that's something I'm promoting in, in the James Bay West side is to let's make our own league. That'd be pretty good to have. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, Shauna, for your question. And thank you, Justin, for sharing your experiences. Now we will go on to Mick. Mick, you had your hand up. Feel free to unmute and ask your question. Thanks a lot. Uh, can't say Justin. Uh, my name's, it says Mick on the screen, but my name's Brian McMillan. I work for Frontier School Division as its phys ed coordinator. And I'm just listening to some of the challenges that you uh, you face coming, trying to get the kids to come out of James Bay to go and um, participate in that. And I was just kind of curious how, um, I, I take it no one comes back to visit you in James Bay then to play you? <laughs> We have not had a school uh, come play. Um, crazy story. Uh, when a team wins their region, right? When a team finishes first in league play, you get the right to host the actual regional tournament. And we did, we won on the year, we won our region. And they put in a rule, they stipulated a rule that uh, no NEOA final, no NEOA regional tournament can be had 60 kilometers north of Highway 11. So um, I know how that came in to play, but uh, so that meant we couldn't host. We, uh, we plowed through the league, eight and zero, first place, we had the right to host. And uh, what we ended up having to do is we got to pick a school. <laughs> along the highway 11 corridor and to be our host community so uh, we picked uh, Kirkham Lake Ontario just because it meant traveling for all the other schools and uh, they had students uh, cheer for us and stuff like that so um, I was pretty upset by all that when I found out about all that so because uh, I is, told them is that northern Ontario high school athletics yeah yeah so yeah no no one wanted to fly no one wanted to fly to come play us so yeah so we've never had I, a, we've never had a home game so i uh the stuff we do in frontier school i i guess first of all um 
I was on the board of directors for Manitoba High School Athletics for 12 years. And it's a lot of the problems you're talking about are similar to what we do in Northern Manitoba. Like I'm based in Cranberry Portage, south of Flintlawn. So if, for those of you who know Canada, the Flintlawn bombers are probably the things you've heard of. It's a mining community, but I'm on the other side of the lake. So that's where I live. But um, our division, we span the entire province of Manitoba. We have 40 schools, 16 high schools, and all of them are pretty much up north. Um, we recently sent our team, our girls basketball team from Churchill at the Duke of Marlboro School to provincials in March and talking about the money that it costs to send people there. Uh, it's been probably 24 years that I've tried to switch the idea of the rest of the province to say, hey, look at the first, the first thing in, in the name of the High School Athletic Association says Manitoba. It's the same thing for you, Northern Ontario. I, I don't understand why, I, to this day, why they know they got to play our, 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 our Indigenous teams from our communities yet they won't come. Uh, some of them might be, they don't understand yet. Maybe they don't factor in money, but keep up the fight because I know I know we've had teams go to Churchill finally. You know, they take the train, they go, we turn it into an educational tour where the kids are there at the uh, at the science center, like the space, they have a rocket range and that. And it, uh, it turns into things like that. Like you might be able to get people to buy into it, you know, partner with the school, but and I know uh, we've done that. So, but I'm listening to what you're saying there and I, it, it's all the same stuff that we've had to go through and then mm -hmm. just in money, you know, getting a plane to fly kids out, you know, a three hour flight for you or two hour flight from your community to say to Kirkland Lakes, probably about $19,000, you know, like it's not one and that's one way. <laughs> so anyway, I, uh, I commend you on what you do. That's, this is, I really enjoyed this. Miigwech. 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 Yeah, we don't bite. I keep telling people that. <laughs> a good place to go. If I could ever come there, I will. <laughs> uh, guys. Thank you, Mick. Thank you, Justin. Does anyone else have any questions? Feel free to pop it in the chat or raise your hand and unmute. Mm -hmm. So I see Ethan has a question here. So Ethan's saying, thank you, Justin, for your presentation. Are the kids at the James Bay participating in other sports or extracurriculars? Are youth eager to join basketball or is recruiting participants difficult at any time? Yeah, um, I guess uh, one of the things that I wanted to mention, you know, in, in this presentation is that uh, the basketball program historically 2011 2014 was dependent on people who weren't competitive or who weren't um in totally in total love with the sport right it was a means to an end for their education for their physical well-being so when season's over as and i don't see them in the gym from like let's say their season's done in november for a girl um i don't see them in the gym from december till august and you know, like they don't want to work on their game. They don't, they're going out doing their own thing, but they come back September and they're there every day. Like I, I had nothing to, uh, you know, um, I was fine with that really. Like, what can you say to that if someone's not in love with the sport, but they're going to be there with you the whole time when it's time. So, um, so there's a lot of players like that. And, uh, I, frankly, I commend them because they're, they have other things to do, which is really, really cool. Like when it came to me, they were there. And uh, those were the easiest players to coach, in my opinion, because they weren't so emotional toward it, right? So the ones who were there off season, like, you know, they were more vocal and they were more, um, um, more strength behind their stance on things. No, we should do things this way. You know, like they were more, um opinionated so um and of course i love those players because they work hard during the offseason like i get a respect for that too so was it difficult no because uh i made sure to let people know like if you're not in love with the sport that's cool like do your thing if you have other things to do great but when it's time to listen to me you know everything's absolute what i say you, you'll get no no hay from me right so um so uh, for them, it was the trip, you know, they got to get out of the community and go hang out with their friends, you know, oh, we got to play a game. So it was more on the side, oh, we play basketball on the side, 
it's more like go hang out in these uh, urban centers down south go for a flight you know stuff like that eat at a buffet you know at the end of the trip we would find a buffet so <laughs> stuff like that so um as for other extracurriculars there wasn't much there in terms of organized um like you know league settings nothing like that um what i did notice though was there's a big uh, push for um music and um you know, video editing skills, audio skills, you know, like all that stuff. And Fort Albany would contract those kind of workers up there and, you know, show the youth how to make a video, how to write songs, how to play instruments. You know, there, there is more of it like that. But as in terms of extracurricular school providing that, it's really hard to have that. And of course, a lot of First Nations communities know about that. So, um, so yes, youth are eager. <clears throat> but uh, there's a lot of... Uh, convince not a lot of convincing there's understanding with youth like okay basketball it's probably not your first thing you choose if you're in a south setting it's probably you're probably a volleyball player you're probably a track and field person you know like um but this is all you got and then we need you because we're a small community we have a high school of 50 students so um yeah we had a, we had a, had a small pool of individuals and it took a lot of uh controlling on my part to you know keep them on track and uh so yeah, um, not many opportunities from where we are on our side. So, but uh, we're still coming up with all these talented musicians and artists and all this stuff. It's it's kind of phenomenal, really, to see some of our people succeed. I, I know uh, Sean on the east side will say the same. Like some of these talented individuals didn't even have an infrastructure to to build off, right? So that somehow they did it on their own. So, um, so yeah, um, thank you for that question. <clears throat> for example, Bradley George Kish, no, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Ethan. Thank you, Justin. Does anyone else have any questions? Actually, Justin, I had a quick question. Yep. Um, I was wondering when it comes to, I guess, playing organized sport like basketball and specifically having to play other teams from other nations, uh, I'd love to know how uh, COVID has affected uh, your research and how uh, community members and um, I guess your athletes uh, experience holistic growth because of COVID. Yeah, it really hurt them. Um... I had to do my thesis on virtually, right? So I wanted to go up to Fort Albany and sit down with people uh, face to face, but we had to do it uh, through Zoom. So, and the past couple of years, especially the ones who were hardcore, who uh, put in the time in the off season, went into the gym at seven in the morning before school, you know, those kind of players, um, they really had a hard time because they didn't have access to the gym. Uh, gym was closed and, uh, they realized what basketball can do for them at that time. Like, I think it helped with my interviews. Like, they can look back. At, wow, like, basketball had a huge impact on my life, on my health, on my mental, physical health. So, yeah, uh, it was hard. Um, they want me to come back once things open up and open the gym again. So, I'll be traveling back and forth. Like, um, so, yeah, good question. It was, it was really hard. Um, on them and I really felt for them so thank you yep does anybody else have any further questions for Justin before we uh, end the session Uh, and if not, um, yeah, as Sean said, um, all breakout rooms will be closed um, at 12 and everyone will join the main room automatically. Uh, so um, I encourage everyone right now to uh, go grab some lunch, go outside, um, take a break, um, or for the remainder seven minutes, um, feel free to join another session and um, see what's going on there. Uh, so thank you so much, Justin, for your presentation. Yeah. <clears throat> right on. 
uh, miigwech for having me. It was fun. All right, and I'll see everyone else at um, the rest of the conference. Wache, wache. Justin. Yep. Hey, Justin. Hey, Justin. Yeah. This kind of shows you how small our world is, eh? Yeah, I know, yeah. <laughs> cool, I'm glad you came. It's awesome. <laughs> you did good there. Yeah, thanks. Uh, still, like, uh, the COVID got me pretty good, so still recovering. Oh, it yeah. hit, uh, I think, two out of four in my house this past Christmas. Yeah. No. Me, my husband, and two of my sons had a virtual Christmas. Oh, really? Yeah, I was alone with my girls at home. Oh, that's rough. Uh, I cried the whole day. <laughs> I bet. I know I had my day. I had my day, yeah. So, uh, okay. Well, glad you're, glad you're, yeah, glad you're, yeah, nice to see you tonight. Nice to hear from you. I hope to be there again. Thank you, Justin, yeah. for your uh, presentation today. And, uh, you know, like I said, uh, hopefully in the future, uh, you know, our conference will be in person, but we will still have the, you know, Zoom aspect of the conference. So, uh, you know, we hope that you can uh, present at one of our future conferences there. So, um, you know, stay in touch and, uh, yeah, we hope to see you in the future. All right, miigwech. Thanks for the offer. Have a great day. Thank you. you. Later, everyone.